All right, here we go. We have comedian Doug Williams in the building. Welcome Th to Vlad TV. Thanks for having me, man. This is just, you're like the wizard, you know, because we never see you. You're like the guy behind the curtain and just, I know your voice. So when you came in, I heard your voice. I knew exactly who you were. I like it like that. <laughs> I like to be able to go to the grocery store without security all the time and <laughs> go to the mall and, you know, have people just leave me alone. <laughs> right, right. That's great, though. You have a recognizable voice now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's your first time here, so I want to start in the beginning. So, you grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. South, heart of the South, the cradle of uh, the birthplace of the Civil Rights Movement. Right, right. Very famous area. Very. That's where the marches were, Martin Luther King, and, and everything else like that. Um, now, a lot of that stuff happened kind of before your time. But growing up in that type of area, what was that like? So my parents experienced it. Right. My parents, are, you know, my family is from Alabama. My grandparents, my parents. So, uh, you know, it's funny because I live here in Los Angeles now. And it was such a different display of people moving to, uh, to Los Angeles because I grew up in the 70s there, 70s, 80s. It was black and white. You know, Mexicans or Latinos have worked their way there now, obviously, but it was just, it was black and white. So the racism there, it was just, it was black and it was white. But here in Los Angeles, one of the things that I've noticed that there's so many nationalities, you just can't focus on hating one group or the other group will get ahead. So the racism is spread out here more, you know, so it's right. more opportunity. <laughs> to hate. <laughs> right. <laughs> more people You got to spread hate. your hate around right. a little like more. You can't just focus on black people. Right. So, yes, I think that's the uh, the difference. Uh, okay. What did your parents go through? Was there any stories? Were they participating in the marches and the, the Selma march and stuff like that? You know, my mother wanted to be uh, active, but uh, her my grandparents were always afraid mm. yeah, because there were consequences with that. You didn't know if you were going to get hit or or the hoses turned on you. So I think my parents were more engaged uh, in terms of protesting, not getting on the buses uh, and things of that nature. But physically being involved in those protests, I don't know how much my grandparents would have allowed that on both sides uh, with my father being a black male out of fear of uh, the, the, the repercussions. Yeah. You know, a lot of people were killed after those demonstrations going back home or returning to their, 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 where they live. So I think they were limited in that capacity, but involved in supporting the movement uh, where boycotting and things like that were concerned. Uh, did you experience a lot of racism growing up in that area? You know, I think I was isolated from it because I grew up in a, a lower middle-class black neighborhood and we kind of just hung out with our friends. Uh, the high school that I attended was uh, was uh, black and white, but you kind of gravitate towards who you're comfortable with. So in that sense, I don't think I was exposed to it uh, directly, maybe indirectly, but uh, nothing that comes out to mind other than being stopped by the police and, and, and things of that nature, racial profiling. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so you didn't start off with comedy. You actually started off as a rapper. Correct. Correct. That was, you know, I, I wanted to entertain. Early on at my church, uh, I recited, they had a contest to recite the 13th Corinthians. And I participated in that at an early age, maybe eight, nine years old. And in doing so, I just got a, a bug for performing in front of people. So initially I started out rapping, but my raps weren't, at, at the time, we we're talking the 80s where it was conscience, you know, you had a uh, Public Enemy, you had Run DMC rapping about hard times. And I was rapping about big women in spandex. And, and I had a serious partner by the name of ICG at the time. And he was just like, you know, it's just, it's not gelling. You know, I'm talking about hard times and trying to pay, you know, rent. And you're talking about fat women in spandex. So he just suggested, he said, you know, I think you should try comedy. Maybe that that's your stick. So my first year of college, Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, in 1990, I found a comedy club and went up and performed at that comedy club. They were having a contest to see who would be the new house MC. They had a midget. I don't know if you can say midget now. Is it short person or midget? I don't know where we are. It's kind of like the M word, you know, it just evolves. You have yeah, to. Yeah, I think midget is actually derogatory. Yeah, so let's huh. correct that. A little person. Little person. There you yeah, go. Yeah, I think we're there now. Yeah. It's like the evolution of, you know, color uh, 
this, and then I think we're black now. So uh, I went in, did really well at the contest, uh, uh, did not win, uh, but the owner saw something in me that he didn't see in the winner. So he gave me the job as the house MC, and my first, the first person coming in was Steve Harvey. And he asked uh, Steve Harvey to mentor me, to watch me, and he did, and that kind of set me on my way. So the first person I ever worked with as a stand-up comedian was Steve Harvey. Okay, was this the Kings of Comedy, Steve Harvey, or did that come later? No, this was the Steve Harvey that had just done uh, the Apollo. So he mm. had just done the Apollo, which was a big deal. He did the whole little eye thing, uh, and he was a national headliner, but he was not nationally known yet. He had just had his first big TV appearance. Okay. Which was Showtime at the Apollo. Okay. So this was someone that was still on the rise as well. This was not an established big... No, not at all. Okay. And he helped you out. He went out of his way. He did. He, okay. he, he not only did he, uh, and I, I, I wrote about this. I, I write these uh, little op-eds. I wrote about it on my uh, Facebook uh, page. Uh, he was big into dressing. Steve always believed that you should show up like you were showing up to work. So at the time, I was big into LL Cool J. And I would wear these warm-ups and Kango, and I would go on stage like that. Kind of looked like LL Cool J. And the first night he told me, he said, uh, make sure you dress up. Because he came in like on a, the night before, and I met him. He was like, hey, make sure you dress up. So I came in like LL Cool J. And he was like, hey, man, I told you to dress up. So tomorrow night, come dressed up. So the next night I came back the same way. And he was like, ah, so you won't be working tonight. And so I told you to dress up. And I said, well, man, I don't have time. And he said, well, you got about 15 minutes to get back. So I had to rush back to the dorm room, change my clothes. And I came back, uh, you know, put a button-up shirt on, some slacks. And he said, that's how you should dress. So the next day, he took me shopping. He mm. took me shopping and bought about five outfits, really nice shirts and pants. And he was like, this is how you should dress when you're on stage. And he paid for everything. He paid for everything. Because you were a broke college student. I was a broke college student, freshman year. And he took me to the mall and bought everything, you know, handpicked it out, watched me try it on and say, hey, this is how you should dress. Right. And we're not talking about multimillionaire Steve Harvey. Not at all. At that point. Not at all. You know, all. these days he's worth like 200 million, according to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> according right. to the internet. <laughs> right. <laughs> this was not even probably millionaire Steve Harvey back then. This was thousandaire no, this Steve was Harvey. Steve Harvey just trying to... Who, who was happy that he, he, he did really well on Apollo. And I think at that time, there was talk about bringing him back to host it. His set was so, he did so well on the Apollo that there, there was talk. So I, I remember him saying this, hey man, I just did really well on the Apollo. And I think they're, they're thinking about bringing me back as the host. That's dope. Do you guys still keep in touch? No, I don't, uh, uh, you know, once he made it, I think, you know, I think time creates distance if you're not just relevant in someone's life where you're calling them and this and that. But, you know, every time he sees me, he's like, hey, he knows who I am. Hey, Doug, how's it going? I think he mentioned me on the on, on his show uh, a few times. Uh, I know every time he thinks about Alabama, he thinks about me and uh, probably Ricky Smiley. Okay, so you're going to Alabama State University. Right, I transferred the next year to uh, from Oakwood College, which is in Huntsville, mm -hmm. which is a Christian college a seven-day Adventist college, to be exact, to uh, Alabama State University. Okay. And I guess right before you graduated, you decided to move to L.A. Actually, I was supposed to graduate, and uh, my theater teacher was Dr. Tonia Stewart, who was on a show called In the Heat of the Night. She was in the theater department. So I had expressed to her through doing stand-up that I wanted to act. So she let me do a couple of plays. And in that time, we developed a friendship. So she had a manager that was coming through, and she referred me to the manager. And the manager said, hey, you need to be out here in Los Angeles. And I needed, like, a, one more class to get my degree. But she called and said, hey, there's some opportunities opening up. I think you should be here. So I moved to Los Angeles, you know, finished all of my classes, needed, like, one more class. And, uh, like, two months after that, I booked the, uh, the Nutty Professor with Eddie Murphy uh, and Tom Shadyac. So, so did you ever graduate or no? I went back. I just graduated in 2015. Oh, I finally wow. went back and took that class. <laughs> Decades later. <laughs> right. And uh, I wanted my kids to see me to graduate. And so I took the class actually out here online because I only needed, needed an elective. Graduated and then went back and walked the stage uh, in 2015. I mean, your parents were like 
pissed well, off. Well, I fooled them. Hell. I fooled them and told them I had to graduate. I said, hey, you know, I'm just not doing the ceremony. I graduated. Oh, I got okay. To so you lied to your parents. Got and it. my wife, too. Everybody <laughs> thought I had a degree. <laughs> okay. So you come out to L.A. and you get on The Nutty Professor. And did you have any speaking parts? I did. Movie? I introduced Dave Chappelle. Oh, yeah, I came out. Give it up argument. for Reggie Warrington. If you go back and watch that now, every club scene, I introduced uh, Dave Chappelle. Give it up for Reggie Warrington. Uh, uh-huh. Montel Jordan goes off stage. I come out, put the microphone stand. I was probably about 30 pounds lighter then. Uh, what was it like to see Eddie Murphy in full swing? Because the Nutty Professor. You know, I'm not going to say it's his biggest movie or his greatest movie, but that was the movie that really kind of pushed the envelope in terms of his creativity, in right. terms of, I mean, I guess he did that in Coming to America to a certain degree, but he really did it in The Nutty Professor, by playing his own, multiple characters and everything. By his own admission at the time, and he didn't know how successful that movie was going to be, but he said that that was his make or break movie because- Prior to that, he had had a couple of follow-up movies, uh, I think Beverly Hills Cop, a few movies that didn't do well. Mm -hmm. And so the conversations I remember vividly that we had on that set, he was so humble and he was so, it was was a comeback movie of such for him. And he was like, this has to do it. This is it. If not, he felt like he was going to just teeter out. So he was so ingratiating. And what people don't realize about Eddie is that he's a genius. Eddie has the ability to do those characters and to transform like this. There were a couple of scenes that he did, uh, and, and one in particular I remember when he was in the restaurant and he and he was given, if you go back and watch that movie, he was given the formula for the transformation from Buddy Love to Professor Clump. And he was like the turkey neck and this and he had, and those words were like really big words. So he kind of flubbed it a couple of times and, and, and they brought it to him. He said, hold up, let me just, Give me five minutes. And I watched him kind of struggle through it. He went in a corner, he looked at it, and in five minutes, he had that down. So what 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 he was doing, or what he actually did, was, I'm assuming, given to him that day in terms of them writing down that formula. And he did it in five minutes. After looking at it for about five minutes, he got it down and he came back and did not make one mistake each take. 